and I think you're probably supposed to start. We're ready to start. All right, fine. So, um, yeah. welcome back to Tech in Ghana 2020 uh, for session 3B, the power of collaboration in agritech. Today we're going to be looking at Ghana's agricultural sector and a lot of the challenges which are facing it, but also a lot of the solutions out there, the agri-tech or agricultural technology solutions and the collaborations going on in the sector to increase yields and reduce losses and ultimately to get more value out of the agricultural value chain in Ghana. We have an interesting group of panelists um, who I would like to individually introduce themselves and then we will get on to the main discussion. But I would like to um, urge everyone, please do submit questions um, uh, during this panel. We'll be very interested to answer as many of them as we can using uh, the questions button that you have there on your console. So if I could start by asking the panelists to introduce themselves, let's go with uh, ladies first, uh, Melanie. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Melanie banister I'm, I'm an epidemiologist based at an Australian epidemiology organization called OSVET. So we actually work on diseases across the One Health spectrum. And by that, I mean at the human, animal, plant or environmental interface. And we're working uh, together with PharmaLine on a crop pest and disease surveillance project in Ghana, which we're excited to talk about more during this panel. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Walali. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Walali Senyo and I lead the, um, the business development unit um, at PharmaLine. Um, I will talk a bit later about what we do, but I mostly manage client and partner relationship um, uh, at the company and um, I look forward to sharing a lot of the experience and lessons we have uh, gathered as a company uh, work in the agri-tech space here. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Alexander Sarak. Um, uh, thanks, Ted, and uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alex Sarak. I'm uh, based in the Dubai office of Edelshaw Goddard, um, and I'm part of the Edelshaw Goddard um, uh, Africa Business Group. Uh, my background is I'm a projects and projects finance lawyer, but I've been working in the agricultural space passionately for many years in Africa. Uh, I had the privilege of advising a number of governments in agricultural PPP projects, outgrower schemes, and pretty much, I mean, uh, anything related to infrastructure in the agrospace, and also work with some of the leading uh, Pan-African agricultural um, supply chain businesses, um, help them on uh, the, in their transactions from um, acquiring um, uh, trucks, transportation vehicles, um, uh, warehousing, facilities, processing plants, all the way up into the food and beverage uh, uh, end of the supply chain. And I'm very excited to be on this panel today and talk about collaboration in this space. That's great, thank you very much, Alex. Um, we have a couple of other panelists who've been having connection issues today, but I think, do we have Eric? Are you on the line? Hi now. Yes, hi, Eric, yes. If yes, you would I'm just please line. introduce yourself, thank you. Hi. Sorry, I had a few challenges with my connection. So I was please able to ahead. resolve it somehow. Please introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Good. Uh, my name is Ted. Hello? I'm afraid we're hearing you, Clary. So um, I work for OCP Ghana Limited as the business development manager. And I'm currently managing um, two projects, the OCP School Lab and the um, Hello? I think, we're of, I think we're having a bit of an issue with the connection. Maybe try connecting again, Eric. But anyway, thank you. And um, we'll be getting back to you as well. I also realize I should have introduced myself. I am Ted George, founder and chief narrative officer of Kleos Advisory. Uh, we offer thought leadership and strategic advisory on uh, African markets, commodity value chains, and fintech. And so agri-tech is a space that uh, we work in a lot, particularly in Ghana in the cocoa sector. So I'm very interested to hear about some of the different uh, innovations which are out there at the moment. So without further ado, why don't we start with our first opening discussion. What I'd like to do is to take the temperature, so to speak, of Ghana's agricultural sector. How fragmented is the value chain and how are things like yields um, and post-harvest losses? Are they a serious concern? Uh, maybe if I could start with you, Walali. 
Sure, thank you. Um, so as we, we, we know for most African countries, um, the economy of Ghana uh, is largely agrarian. Um, and agriculture over the period uh, we see has done quite considerably well. Um, if you consider the non-traditional export contribution to GDP, it was about 35%. Uh, which is in the region of uh, $351 million contribution to GDP. But generally, um, we see the contribution of uh, agriculture to GDP declining, which is um, very synonymous to you know, uh, growing middle income or developing country uh, for that matter. Um, in aspects or when you take um, specifically looking at the yield, um, uh, post-harvest um, issues, um, we realize that um, gradually there is uh, a significant improvement also in uh, output um, uh, from, you know, arable, you know, crops, um, uh, cash crops and the likes with seen uh, within 6.2 uh, to 5% uh, annual growth rate. Um, and there is still room for improvement because considering uh, what we have on the uh, region, um, if you take per hectare um, yield of say maize, uh, we're doing, uh, farmers are doing about 1.8 um, tons per hectare as compared to 5.5 uh, tons per hectare. So there's quite a, you know, a huge opportunity to improve that. Um, I must say that, um, Agriculture is largely, within our space, is largely um, led by smallholders, um, you know, about uh, 2.5 million there about, uh, at least for the recent estimate. And um, they mostly cultivate less than two acres um, of, of cropland. So these are very, um, because of the nature of it, uh, it's quite rudimentary, very rural. Um, using very basic tools and stuff. And so there's great opportunity to improve um, the space and help, you know, uh, in, increase yield. Um, and given that it, it forms a very important role in the economy of Ghana, and as you can also or have seen a lot of government interventions, um, the flagship product, uh, policy of this current government, uh, planning for food and jobs, is, you know, being spearheaded and these are the sort of things happening in, 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 in the space. Um, lastly, if I will just touch on post-harvest losses or issues within uh, post-harvest. Um, it is a big issue, uh, especially considering um, how unstructured a lot of the, you know, if you take cereals, for example, are, um, there is a, there's a, a big need uh, pushing smallholder farmers to adopt uh, in increasing uh, quality standards in order to meet, uh, uh, you know, uh, market uh, requirements and also to be able to access other, um, you know, export markets. And so that is also becoming a very strong um, uh, need in, in, in the current trend that we're seeing. I'll pause here and I'll allow my colleagues to also uh, chip in. Yes, thank you very much, Waladi. Um, also, if we could just very briefly, uh, if uh, Alex Broby, I see that you've joined, could you just quickly introduce yourselves and then we'll get back to the questions. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Broby and I hold um, MP Agronomy and um, currently I'm a sustainability consultant for the training company in cocoa sector. Uh, before joining Sogden, I went as a freelancer um, as an auditor for RE Food Certification Program for about seven years. And um, I'm, I'm well, I mean, when it comes to certification programs, sustainability works, I'm, I'm, I'm well um, versed in that area. So um, I'm very excited to be here to share my experience and knowledge uh, as a panelist here. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks very much. We'll get back to you in a sec. Uh, if I could move to you now, Melanie, um, how serious an impact on yields are things like uh, pest infestation and disease in, in Ghana's agricultural sector? Uh, thanks, Ted. Yeah, in fact, it's a very good question because one of the difficulties in answering is that 
know for a lot of different crop pests and diseases. So I guess um, probably everybody's had a fall armyworm, which is an invasive or exotic pest that has uh, wreaked havoc with maize crops across much of the continent, in fact. And so there's been quite a bit of work in recent years to try to understand the extent of uh, maize and other primary crop loss due to fall armyworm. You know, depending on the region, estimates can range anywhere from 20 to 80 percent. Um, but I think it's also really important to remember that there are a whole range of uh, endemics, so common pests and diseases of food crops, um, many of which have, you know, have always been present. Uh, the crop losses associated with some of these uh, more common and more established pests and diseases is particularly challenging. So again, the best data we often have are kind of global modelled estimates or regional modelled estimates, but to get specific data uh, that holds, you know, true year after year or region after region or season after season within Ghana is actually really challenging. But indeed, it can be really substantial and in, in a difficult um, year, you can have, you know, 80% of, of total crop loss in, in a really bad, um, you know, infestation or, or disease event, but equally you might have relatively minor crop loss um, depending on how well pests and diseases are managed. So not a straightforward question to answer, but much that can actually be done, I guess, to mitigate those losses. Absolutely, and I think that's partly why your technologies exist, to actually get a better view of the data, which we'll get onto in a bit. Um, Alex Sarek as well, um, how do you view the, the yields and the, the, the harvest challenges that there are on the agricultural value chain in Ghana? Yeah, I mean, I think as a lawyer, I will probably ditch this, this question. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about how to, how to prevent uh, or ensure against losses um, when they when they happen to occur, and I think there is lots that can be done. Uh, uh, trying to identify business models, of course, manage manage um, uh, um, uh, the agricultural production itself better, exchanging data. But I think um, once that is available, also coming up with business models to either diversify um, or or de-risk or ensure risk, I think will will it will eventually hopefully play a role because at the end of that. Uh, uh, all of these uh, yield losses, there, is, there are farmers and businesses and families that are relying on income. And uh, if we want to sustain that supply chain, we have to come up with smart solutions as well. But I, I'm not an agricultural expert to give more no, details on which that's one. Indeed, no, no, thanks. That's a good first answer. Um, Eric, maybe if I could get your view also. Uh, one of the big issues when it comes to yields is inputs or sometimes the lack of provision of inputs. Um, you know, how is the, the, the fertilizer distributor system in Ghana? Are, are the, is the fertilizer getting to where it's needed? Eric, I think you're on mute. Eric? Yes, yes. Right, Thank you, ahead. Ted. Um, yield losses are due to a lot of factors. Input is one of them. <clears throat> Availability of input, quality input, and affordable input is one of them. <clears throat> then what we have realized, and that's what OCP is trying to do, is that a lot of um, um, soils are not analyzed. So um, to get the soil status of the farmers is another key thing, which we do yields and productivity. And that's what OCP is doing. And we have a program we're doing, um, testing the soils of various uh, smaller farmers, which we want to project to the commercial farmers from last year. We've done that in over six regions in the whole of the country, within the for free for the farmers, just to raise the awareness, the need for them to test their soils. So once the soils are tested, tested, that's the first, the starting point to know what type of fertilizers to apply, the right amount of fertilizers to apply, and at what times. So this is the starting point, and that's what OCP is doing, using a um, sophisticated um, weapon and gadget equipment mm -hmm. to test their cells, get them real-time information of their cells. Mm -hmm. So that is one um, cost of the yield, lower yields. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the reduced yields is, um, I think I mentioned it, the diseases, um, cause of disease and um, pests that are also affecting the yields of farmers a lot, uh, which has now, with regards to the fertilizer distribution systems, hither to um, most of the companies importers were developing the market, creating the, um, the distribution channels, developing their network. But with the onset of the um, subsidy system, a lot of the companies have relaxed this and it has become an easy market, market for most of the importers. So they are not doing the hard work to create the market to establish the networks, 
to get fertilizers to the farmers to their doorsteps. So that is one limitation, and that's also affecting availability of fertilizers on the market. Because certain times the importers are giving a quota, and then as a result of a lot of um, fraudulent and other activities, actual imports are not done. The volume of fertilizers that to be imported and sent to the farmers, supplied to the farmers, are not done. So that is affecting availability of fertilizers on the market. So that's also, mm -hmm. in a way, affecting the yields and output of farmers. So basically, these are some of the problems. And in regards to yield losses, I think uh, market is also another aspect. Some of the farmers are not getting access to market. And so mm -hmm. it, it's harvest time, and a lot of the things go waste because they can't market their produce. So um, I think these are some of the things I'll, I'll talk about for now. And so that's great. look at some other factors as well. That's great. No, thank you very much, Eric. And, and Alex Brobby as well. Uh, when you look at yields, particularly in the sugar sector, you know, how are they? What kind of challenges do you have where, during the harvest? Right. Um, let me speak to this in general. I mean, from an agronomic point of view, um, talking of uh, um, low harvest, we can attribute to, I mean, uh, approved varieties for farmers to cultivate. Okay. Something that is very important. Uh, we are faced with climate change and we need to shift the pools. I mean, we have need to think outside the box, um, inject in um, um, research work to come up with a variety that farmers can depend on to, to hit their yield target. It's something very important, um, meaning we should improve our extension, okay, where we can empower people to, I mean, um, go out there give knowledge to farmers on this um, new technology of um, farming because uh, to be honest um, climate change now has made everything unpredictable farmers you know Ghana here uh, virtually room uh, we depend on real fed agriculture and um, 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 it, it, it's sad that at some point you see that farmers will put in much energy uh, plant and they will not get the expected yield so we need to look at planting material very very important and um we also thought of um marketing i mean because harvest loss yes farmers will put in more energy and they will harvest their produce in the end no 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 pragmatic um processing to to, to get this um produce i mean in a proper storage area so they end up losing everything and um it's sad that you visit communities you see i mean um, food even getting overripe and getting spoiled, and it is very disturbing. So I think this is common, it's something that we've been seeing around, and we, I think um, we need to think around this and see how best we can improve um, to increase yield and also to think of, um, I mean, uh, um, storing um, 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 these produce um, after it has been harvested. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah sorry. Okay, yeah, so with the issue of markets, I think uh, one thing that has been done uh, with structures and processes, um, there's a kind of commodity exchange which is trying to help, you know, um, create market access for cereal and other, you know, uh, uh, commodities that is being produced locally. Um, there are, you know, important um, training that farmers need to know when it comes to, you know, uh, handling of their produce. So uh, things to do with, um, uh, if, you know, use of agrochemicals, which is quite, you know, increasing as um, data is showing. Uh, but these are important um, to allow smallholder farmers in as much as we want to increase their productivity there are also opportunities that they can access, um, either putting the, their produce in the warehouses and then they can actually um, access finance or you know, credit using those as uh, collateral. And that's uh, something that's happening in the space and various you know, stakeholders are basically looking to leverage on it. But there's a lot of work to be done in getting farmers to understand the right way to, you know, uh, to do production, and which is a big thing that uh, as a farmer line we're doing to support uh, smallholder farmers to, you know, change their behavior in adopting uh, new practices. Thank you. 
That's great. Um, yes, well, um, uh, one thing I'd like to now, uh, as we can see, there's quite a lot of challenges out there in the market. Um, but one of the big issues which is coming up quite a bit is about this question of data. Um, how do we actually know how serious the situation is? Um, I think a lot of people who don't work in agritech maybe don't realize just how important data is and good data in order for the agritech to work. So I'm interested to know, asking each of you, um, how crucial is data to what you do in the agri sector? Um, you know, what challenge do you face in collecting this data and in processing it? Maybe Melanie, if I could start with you. Uh, thanks, Ted. Um, and I really appreciate the, the latter part of your question about how do we process it and how do we use it? Because I think there's this general idea now that we're moving into a big data future. Um, but I think far less attention is being paid to how do we actually make the data useful to decision makers and recognizing that smallholder farmers themselves are the primary decision makers um, to whom uh, the data should actually serve a purpose. So I guess uh, if we talk pests and diseases, which is my area of interest, um, one of the big issues is that there's almost no uniformly collected data on crop pests and disease presence, which makes it really difficult at, at regional or national or, or global scales to plan coordinated responses to try to reduce the impacts of, you know, region-wide pest and disease outbreaks. Um, but on the other hand, you have to think about, well, how are you going to get the data? You know, there's some passive approaches like remote sensing technologies that are being used to try to estimate the extent of crop pest and disease infestations. Um, but of course, the people who are dealing with uh, crop pests and diseases on their farms are a really, really rich source of data on the one hand. Um, but much of how we traditionally would try to access that data is, you know, through various forms of you know, regulatory requirements, try to insist that people basically report data to authorities who then compile data and perhaps in an annual report at the end of the year, there's some nice figures and even later on that data actually gets picked up by somebody else and maybe by the time it's ever used, it's already two years out of date. Um, so that's a really, really significant issue. Um, and so if we want to talk about how crucial data is, we have to talk about how we get it um, and how we then return a service in exchange for that for that data, if you like. Um, so what we're doing in Ghana is working very closely with PharmaLine to implement this quite innovative approach, which we're calling surveillance as a side effect of service, if you can stomach the alliteration. Um, but basically the idea is that uh, uh, farmers using just their feature phone, they can dial a USSD code um, and then they receive an automatic call that guides them through an interactive voice response uh, medium to give um, information about crop pests and diseases for major food crops as well as cocoa. So for example, if you know somebody's noticing something's wrong with their maize, they send in this code, they receive a call, there's a voice response that says, you know, have you got a problem? Is there a problem with the leaves? And if they say yes, they'll get asked a, a series of questions about what they can physically observe is wrong with the leaves. Um, and at the end of that, what happens in the background is that data is processed and uh, we run a, a kind of diagnostic algorithm on it, if you like, and try to identify the most likely diagnosis that corresponds to that particular set of signs and symptoms. And so what happens is as soon as the farmer hangs up from the first call, basically within a minute or so, they receive a call back that says, we think this is the problem that you're having with your pest, with your, with your crop. We think it's this particular pest and disease. Here's the recommended, you know, low cost or, or green management strategy, or if it, you know, might warrant a more a more serious intervention like certain types of um you know chemical pesticides and so forth will offer to say well you know please speak to your community agent or so forth for more information and so what that does is it basically makes the reporting of data something that's useful for the farmer because they receive immediate tailored uh, management advice for how to respond to the problem that they're seeing right as they stand there on their farm and kind of an as a side effect of that or as byproduct we're actually getting a remarkably high number of reports of, you know, endemic crop pests and disease problems from uh, smallholder farmers in all of the different communities where we're trialling this approach so far. Um, and previously there was there was almost no comparable data. You're otherwise waiting for a survey to be done every few years or a research study to be done or, or so forth. But this is really trying to make routine data collection on crop pests and diseases viable and sustainable and doing so by providing that um, immediate feedback and service delivery for farmers themselves. 
Thanks, Melanie. I think it's so interesting what you say about this idea that data actually comes back to the farmers as well, because I think so often they're told that they have to collect this data, they fire it out, they never see any use for it. If it comes back as something useful, there's a loop of usefulness, they understand the value. And I wonder, Alex, Robby, as well, if I could get your views on this. How, how important is data to your business model? And what challenges have you had to actually get the data and analyze what it really means? All right, so thank you very much, Ed. Yeah, um, data is a starting point for decision making to me, my area of work. Um, let me share this general experience. I got to a time I was driving and I realized that um, farmers have put much energy planting maize and I mean, everything just got spoiled. Why? Because um, they were relying on rainfall. So we don't have credible weather data, okay, for farmers. farmers uh anticipate or they expect the rains to come in and the rain freeze them so if we have let's say a reliable weather data at least somebody or a responsible farmer can rely on this data and take decision this is what i mean so weather data is something that i see to be challenging in all aspects of agriculture here in ghana okay let me also scale it into the cocoa sector where i'm, I'm currently working um not too long ago, we, 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 we partnered with Farmerly to, to embark on um, mapping data collection, okay? And the, the essential part of it is, um, I mean, customers nowadays, chocolatiers, they all want to protect their credentials and credibility in this cocoa business. They don't want to solve from areas where um, uh, it's seen as protected areas, okay? Um, where child labor and, I mean, talk of all the, problems in the cocoa sector. So they are much concerned about um, mapping. So farmer like came in and they help us in collecting data. Now this is what we, we, we do with the data. You know, we have, I mean, other platform like the Google Earth that we use to analyze to find out whether farms are in protected areas or even in the buffer area so that we can have a farm management plan to monitor this farm from extending into this uh, uh, um, 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 protected areas. So. The point here is data is very important. Data helps us to defend ourselves whenever we, I mean, there's this argument of you are sourcing from irresponsible areas. So it's very, very important. Now the uh, the question here is, how cheap is this analytical tool? How cheap is, is, is um, I mean, that tool for everyone to use it, to collect data, analyze it well and make a meaningful decision out of it so this is what we are also looking at so um i mean we started we started and we are improving now if you look at the certification schemes um data picking is something that they are all driving on and if you look at you follow the irish standard everything is about data collection and how we can digitize our data collection. So it's very important in this area of agriculture as we speak now. And um, the challenge as I put there is we advancing that knowledge to, to, to the masses. You know, we are dealing with uh, smallholders farmers who are, I mean, they are with very low level of education and we being the group managers need to design the tool in such a way that they will end up using it, collecting data at a, at a very easy and convenient way for us, for us to make a very meaningful readings into that data after analy analyzing that data. So um, we are gradually getting there. And I think um, with the help of collaborative effort with this agri-tech companies like PharmaLife, we, we, we shall surely get there. So um, it's very, very important um, to talk about data here. Thank you. No, thank you, Alex. And in fact, we'll get on to collaboration just next. I think this is what is so interesting about this question of uh, uh, getting farmers to understand the usefulness of data. So many of the different farmers I've met in the cocoa sector have amazing data, but it's all in their brain. I mean, they know everything about every farm, every local farmer. They could probably tell you all the exact deliveries as well. But while it's up there, it's not helping anyone. Else. And if it can be in the system and there's feedback, it's much better. Um, before I get on to Walali, Absolutely. I just ask also um, uh, Alex Sarek as well. Um, data is so essential when it comes to delivering insurance. You could almost say that risk is like the opposite of data. The more data, the less risk, maybe because you can understand it. But how important is it to you when, when you're looking at doing business in the agricultural sector in Ghana? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, um, it, it's actually, um, I'm looking at this almost as um, agricultural leapfrogging, right? So, so data collection and, and communication that comes along with data. I, I do believe that there's, there's a real opportunity um, for that sector in Africa to hopefully uh, increase crops in a total different way than we are used to do as in, in the US and Europe and in, in South America. I mean, it's, it's all about optimization and quality of product. And if we can agriculture leapfrog and we can increase crops without having to um, uh, diminish biodiversity because we help farmers uh, uh, to just be more efficient and at the same time uh, get better prices uh, to get the products to markets via communication because that's the end of the kind of like the, the, the chain to be able to um, uh, at the same time uh, a transport warehouse have access to facilities and that's all this data so even a small piece of, of, of land that could by itself is, is just not sustainable for like global farming I mean, competing in a global global market commodities market can now be part of a community uh, via communication uh, and not just uh, due to uh, uh, location and do and via technology. That would be for me personally. I'd be very excited to see that and and hopefully we can avoid the mistakes that we have made because it's it's not just uh, I mean the effect of biodiversity but also diversity of product. I mean if you do mass farming or or, or this large scale farming um, uh, that you can only do because you need to optimize production because. The information is not available that provides you access to market if we can cut through all of this in africa i think there would would a lot to be gained and at the same time by combining that data and then have a cooperative approach without having to form cooperatives uh, in, a, in a in a legal sense then you will have access to markets and once you have access to markets you have access to financial products whether that's on the front end uh, funding and financing investments or at the, at, the, at the end and risk insurance. And I, I'd, I'd love to see um, us doing what we can do in other sectors, what we believe we can do. We, we just leapfrog. We, we avoid all these mistakes and do it much better in Africa. I know it's a Absolutely. challenge, but I would love to see. Yeah. Absolutely, no thanks. I like this idea of the digital leapfrog. I remember when I was at university back in the 90s and everyone saying things like, how are we going to get everyone a desktop computer? Uh, how are we going to li lay all of the fiber optic lines? And of course, along comes uh, the smartphone and uh, 3G and just basically jumps that in a single second. So yeah, the, the means of connecting everyone together are much better than they were before. Um, maybe Eric, if I could ask you as well. I mean, you've spoken about the importance of trying to get better data so that you can better provide fertilizer out there. But what kind of challenges have you come up against to get the right kind of data that really tells you what you need to know? Eric, you want to mute? Yeah. Basically, the access to data, the sources of data, identifying where to get what information you want is a, is a big challenge. Sometimes you're looking for some kind of information on fertilizers and some other issues, some other things, and then you can't, you can't seem to find. Then also looking at the credibility of the data. A lot of the data, either they are outmoded, they are not been updated, and you are not too sure about the credibility of the data. And so those are some of the challenges that affect us in um, sourcing for data to do our work. Because in almost all activities, we require data. We need to know what is going on on some other basis. And know. Sourcing the data is a big challenge for, for us some of the times. So you realize that we end up going around and reinventing the wheel. So you have to go over again and start all over, um, gather your own data, put your things together, and then build your own data most of the time. So it's difficult accessing data. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the kind of challenge we have. You know. Absolutely. No. I can understand that as well, but considering generally how fragmented the agricultural sector can be. And maybe, Walali, do you have a final word you'd like to say on data before we get on to collaborate? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think um, in terms of the opportunities that data or the essence of data is, you know, has been said by the panelists, uh, I think where we can, you know, sort of summarize this whole concern is the challenge of the having a, a common reliable and active database or repository of uh, farmers or actors within the agricultural value chain. I think that is the big problem. Um, 
And um, I think this can be resolved through collaboration. And given where we, we've been, you know, the, where we sit and the work we've been doing, we realize oftentimes that actors are basically reinventing the world, as we've already said. But the way we can move forward on this is creating or providing a common repository um, or database that allows for uh, businesses not to reinvent the wheel, not to you know put in hard end cash in building databases of farmers, but then you know uh, building on viable solutions on top of that data to, to help them you know deliver value to smallholder farmers and change the, the space of agriculture. And that's what agritech like Farmer Line are seeking to do to you know harmonize and provide. Uh, a common platform that can uh, serve um, farmers in Ghana and across Africa for that matter. Um, and it's something that we are, you know, uh, pushing very much to work with governments across the continent to, you know, creating sort of an, it could be an open, you know, we can call it an open repository where you, you know, we can easily identify who a farmer is and across programs, you know, be it a development organization, be it a, an agribusiness that is seeking to do business with a farmer, there is that, you know, uh, database or that, you know, resource that they can uh, leverage on and rather focus on delivering the value or the solution that is going to help the farmer access the good weather forecast they need, uh, get the inputs they need, we know the type of soil they have. Those are the things, and that's where we can leapfrog agriculture or take agriculture to the next level. Um, so that's sort of my summing, you know, comment. Thank you, Walali. Yes, I think it's interesting what you're saying, this idea of a repository of data. It's almost like a company's house of the agricultural sector. Um, and they certainly have tried to do it in bits and bobs, but it's all about how you can share this. And of course, that really brings us on to the key topic of this panel, which is this whole question of collaboration. Uh, no single company can resolve these problems on its own. Everyone needs to work with partners. But what I'm interested to know is what makes a good partnership? Uh, what are the challenges you have and what, what are the successful partnerships you have at the moment? I do know several of you are actually working with Farmline. So maybe if I start with the partners first, maybe Melanie, if you want to talk a bit about partnerships and collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we come into this in a kind of strange way. So I'm an epidemiologist and I work with a bunch of other epidemiologists and we can work on a whole range of diseases, no matter what species they occur in. But we, we know very little outside of that very specific area of expertise. Right. So if it's a disease, we can work on it. But anything beyond that, we absolutely have to work with partners. So for us, the, the really brilliant thing about working with PharmaLine is that being a multi-service platform um, that Farmline has and is established within um, many, many communities in Ghana, it's, it's only by building on top of that existing um, you know, broad service platform that we can actually meaningfully integrate something like a pest and disease service because by itself, um, those sorts of services, if they're standalone, they have very, very poor uptake. Um, you know, because nobody's only just managing pest and disease issues, they're managing, you know, they need fertilizer, they need a whole range of other inputs, they need access to market information and so forth. So the, we believe at least the only way to achieve any of this, any of these gains with, with pest and disease is actually to couple it to a, a broader kind of, um, you know, agenda in terms of providing services and, 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 and better options for, for agriculture in general. Yeah, so for us it's fundamental and, and we're quite fortunate to have received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the work we're doing. So we think one of the, the really important other aspects of collaboration is that kind of public-private partnership. So looking at philanthropic organisations and other donors that are able to support work with you know social enterprises, that, but the private sector organisations that are working together to deliver these solutions. So there's not um, so much funding quite like that available, but it plays a really pivotal role in actually supporting innovation. So that's a pretty key part of the collaboration as well. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and uh, Alex Brobby, I mean, how important have partnerships been to you? Which have been the most successful ones and which ones are you trying to develop? Yeah, um, indeed. No company can work in isolation, so definitely you need to collaborate um, effectively with um, companies with expertise. So um, the currently company that I'm working with, yes, we we always collaborate with partners. Um, Ghana, if you look at the cocoa system, um, you need to go through a process to get an uh, allowances to operate here in Ghana. We are not having allowances, so we fall on 
LBCs who we partner with for the implementation of our sustainability work. In this case, we make sure that um, they are credible enough and there are certain activity that we know we, we test their cap capacity and capability. So we have to fall on, I mean, um, other other companies with their expertise. So we've worked with PharmaLife, as I've already mentioned, in um, mapping data collection. So it's a very good, good approach. You know, it also gives you this international recognition because you'll be working with different, different organizations with um, international reputation and expertise to help, um, I mean, boost your, or to reach your destination in terms of your sustainability goal. So um, I see I see this approach to be very, very important to, 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 to boost the agriculture sector here in Ghana. And um, it's all about you, 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 you getting the credible organization. I know of Amalai, and I mean, um, we, we did our due diligence before reaching on Farmalife for this mapping exercise. So what it means here is we have to also, I mean, um, build that skill of due diligence to settle on companies to, to partner with. So uh, it's very important to us. All right. Thank you. So I look before you leap, basically, which I think makes absolute sense. So Wall Alley, some, some glowing references there for your work uh, uh, with your partners, but uh, tell us about some of your other partners as well and uh, the importance you have in the collaboration to develop your, uh, your products and solutions. Yeah, I think uh, we can overemphasize the importance of partnerships. And um, for us, key things we look out for in uh, partnerships is the fact that we are able to jointly develop new solutions that make a difference, um, that partnerships that can help to scale innovations and create impact. And so you can see examples of uh, what uh, Melan shared in terms of the work we're doing with support from Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, we also want to see a win-win. For partnerships to work, it has to be a win-win. Um, it can be a one-sided thing. Um, and what we've also come to realize, at least, I mean, working in this space, uh, especially within agriculture and I guess in general, is the fact that government is a key uh, player to work with and especially what COVID has taught us in this, um, you know, in this year is the fact that governments are here, they are, they are the, you know, they, they, they actually have the, um, the scale um, and also in turn when, you know, when there's no one to tend to, government, you know, are the ones basically that have to hold the fort. And so working with government is really important if you want to, you know, uh, scale innovation, want to create impact, especially within an agrarian, you know, uh, uh, sector um, or economy like Ghana. It's important that we work closely with government, seeing ways to, you know, uh, further enhance work that you're doing, interventions they're doing, um, we all bring expertise to the table. And I think that is something that helps to, um, you know, create the, the value and the work that uh, is necessary. Um, and as the team of this, you know, conference, uh, you know, states, um, we, we also have partnerships, for example, in, um, in innovating new solutions. So we're, there's a lot, we talk about big data in the earlier, you know, uh, uh, discussion. Um, machine learning and AI is really important. We need to, uh, you know, the turnaround time we, you know, in producing or getting insights from data, it's so important. And for us, as part of our work in innovating and improving our solutions, we are building partnerships across uh, multinationals, you know, uh, expertise we don't have in-house. We are leveraging on these to help create you know, a stronger value to our partners we're working with. Uh, from best of all, I would say the farmers, whom we, uh, as a company, uh, as a mission is to create, you know, lasting profit farmers. They are, are you know, prize most, you know, uh, partners we work with. We want to make sure that they succeed because we believe when they succeed, we also succeed. Um, and then all the way to other actors, you know, the, you know, network of, field agents, or as we call them, micro entrepreneurs, who we work with to ensure that we're delivering these services to, um, you know, farmers uh, at the, the cost-effective, you know, at the time that is most critical. 
these are things. And also the other, you know, partners uh, from, you know, investors, financial um, sector players, um, uh, input, you know, providers, resource. These are all key, you know, uh, um, players that we work with in the space to ensure that we are able to deliver um, a bundle of services, a sort of a whole complete, you know, uh, solution to farmers. Um, because just providing farmer weather forecast is not enough. They need to also be able to have access to um, inputs that they, you know, they can use to, and also not just any input, but reliable inputs that ensures that the, uh, the funds they invested into the business, you know, achieve the expected results. Um, so I, for yeah, us, well, these I, are the I, things I, that I want to. I just like to move on Thank you very much, um, Alex Sarek as well. Um, uh, how important are partnerships for you? And you know, what are the most important collaborative relationships that you have uh, when it comes to agriculture? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a collaboration and partnerships. That to me, that is at the essence, at the core of uh, of agriculture and and business. I remember. And I visited my grandparents, and they I, would, I grew up in the city, but they lived uh, at the head of a small farm in a village in Croatia. And um, the farmers would meet every morning at the convenience store, and they would do exactly what we're trying to do at a large scale. They would talk about the weather, they would talk about the crop, they would talk about the market and what they expect will sell next year, diseases and animals, and, and how, to, how to best maintain them. And then during harvest season, um, not every farmer had all the tools and, and machinery required and at the time, I mean, long time ago. I mean, maybe one farmer has a donkey, another one has a horse, but the one has a carriage, and but not all of that, or it has just broken down. And I think sharing, collaborating, collaborating, because partially because driven by just the seasons. I mean, you had to you need to use all your resources at particular times and everybody. Sharing, working together, I think we can learn a lot from farmers. Um, then and, and today. So I think um, it's for us, when I say us, the rest of the, like the, the finance communities, business communities and governments to, to, to plug into that and be part of that story. And I do agree with, uh, um, with some of my fellow speakers. Mani said it, Walani said it, the role of government is important. I think especially where it comes to um, a larger, what I would call infrastructure investments, whether that's uh, a transportation, warehousing, access to markets. I think that we, 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 we need better collaboration and better understanding of governments, not just to let farmers do what they do, but really support them and do better. And I think where, where I th see over, I think the last 10, 15 years, really good collaboration is in the finance space, especially on um, uh, microfinance. I think that in, in that chain of, you know, you, you generate all your income uh, once or twice a year and, and, and you're also exposed to all of that. And makes it really, really difficult, and 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 just the size of the businesses make it really difficult. So I think these are excellent collaborations, and I I do see um, just listening to my fellow panelists, where uh, technology and, and 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 data collection application can really improve everybody's role in this, and and that's very positive to see. But I do think it all starts with the farmers, and I think they already know how to collaborate. Absolutely. I mean, it all starts at the beginning of the value chain, doesn't it? Um, and if we can't see what's going on there, we can't really see anything that's going on. We're just guessing. Um, Eric, uh, there's actually been a specific question for you as well. Someone asking if you could give specific examples of the required data you're looking for. Um, but I wonder maybe if I could just reframe the questions and say, what kind of partners do you need in order to get the data that you really need in order to operate? <laughs> We, we realized since OCP came to Ghana that um, without collaboration, without partners, we, we, we couldn't get anywhere. Right from day one, when we, we started, we have been partnering with institutions, with organizations, both at government level, with private sector, and in, in all our activities, we have partners we're working with. No wonder we signed an agreement, corporate, cooperation agreement with the uh, Ministry of Agri, um, government of Ghana through the Ministry of Agri somewhere last year to work together with them in all our activities, especially with the business development activities. And so um, we have been working in partnership with um, most of the government organizations. We work with CSIR, the Sari Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, Crop Research Institute, Soil Research Institute. We have partnership agreement with them. We're working with a lot of other organizations within a more fast structure, working with the crop services. In all our activities, like the school lab we are doing, we are working with MOFA directly. And so they, they help us with organization of farmers and everything we do, we 
we've involved and more find most of our activities. For the private sector, we have other partners we work with on our agri booster project. We have we decided we decided we, decided, we had initial discussions with even the farmer line to work with them, uh, but to partner with them on the, in the agri booster project. And so we have other actors in the agri booster project. We have um, the AGS Mall who are training service partners. We have other partners we work with um, with regards to input marketing, with regards to output markets, with aggregators. We have partners with a lot of other companies we are working with. So partnership to us um, is very key. Whereas we cannot do anything without the collaborators. So we need the collaborators to get along and, and grow our business here in Ghana. Absolutely. Well, so, I think yes, so I that... Sorry. Sorry, you down? Yes. And in the response, to yes. The question that was asked, you know, we needed okay. we needed a lot of agronomic data, right? And so, um, in order to develop some of our fertilizers on the market, we had to do trials. We had to do a lot of um, agronomic work, and so data was key to us. And so initially we needed a lot of data on agronomy, agronomic issues. So that was where we 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 were, we were um, finding some we were having some challenges getting agronomic data with regards to current production and a lot of other data we wanted. So that is one big area we great. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, yes, no, it's interesting what you say about collaboration. Uh, it reminds me of this expression, which is that competition yeah, makes having better a lot of challenges getting economic uh, data. Sorry, but uh, yeah, collaboration makes better companies. And I think it's interesting to see in collaboration what you can achieve that you literally couldn't if you're on your own. Now, I do encourage delegates to please submit some more questions. We haven't had too many of them, but I think we do have time to look at one more topic today, um, which is this whole issue of sustainability. Um, it has become the watchword of modern business, especially when it comes to the agricultural value chain. It's not just about the potential impact on biodiversity uh, or um, uh, the, the, the quality of the products being produced. It's also about the people who work in the value chain and how they're treated and the different externalities. So how is, I would like to ask you to the panelists, how is your business working to develop a business model that is truly sustainable? I wonder, uh, Melanie, if I could start with you. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I guess, as I mentioned, we work not only in agriculture and in crops, but across some, um, you know, livestock and, and human health and as well. So a lot of what we're trying to do is is understand how do we ensure that if we're trying to provide epidemiological um, services, let's say across multiple different sectors, how can we uh, adjust to, that, let's say, the expectations across different different funders, whether they be government, private sector, major philanthropic donors, um, and how do we ensure that we're able to continue to do this um, internationally and, and for you know the foreseeable future because we do really believe in the work that we're doing. So I think uh, I think for us it's just about recognizing that we know why we're doing what we're doing and just ensuring that we diversify enough of the work that we're doing. Um, and a lot of that includes doing it in partnership with other organizations. So one of the biggest ways that we approach um, the work that we do is to is to foster really good partnerships with people who share our, our values, um, and that's basically you know some of it. I'm aware that we're running slightly short of time, so I'll let other panelists jump in. No, that's great. Thank you. I think that's a really good point about actually sharing values with people you do business with. You can't be sustainable if the person uh, who's doing business on the other line doesn't even know what the term means. Um, Alex Sarek, what, what do you think uh, it me we mean by sustainability, and how do you see? approaches towards it changing in the way people are doing business in the agricultural value chain. Yeah, I think the um, uh, the top-down approach on an international level is really, really extremely important um, uh, because at uh, on the market level, everybody is com competing. But what's very positive is um, sustainability is on the agenda of everybody, but particularly all the financial institutions that will be required to, uh, well, that are that playing a, a big role in this market. And um, this is probably where, where we need to focus. Even at government level, that seems to be sometimes too difficult to implement, but we have uh, various different principles uh, that are being developed at development bank level um, or intergovernmental organizations. And at the moment, uh, I don't see a, a real focus on, on agriculture. It's, it's, it's mainly the main drivers are at the moment on uh, climate change, but we see the sustainability agenda to be widened and and uh, take into consideration, of course, already biodiversity, but 
to trigger that down into farming, I think will be in, in this entire sector will become uh, more and more important. But personally, I believe in that and I see the biggest developments and the biggest push historically in other sectors, uh, especially infrastructure, energy, um, uh, came directly at the intergovernmental level, um, often pushed by, by um, uh, private organizations, NGOs and, and, and others. But I, I have the biggest hope, let's say, to put, uh, um, that we see the big developments that then will trickle down uh, also into the agriculture sector. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, Eric, if you could just briefly say, um, what is sustainability when it, um, uh, for OCP? What, is, what are you trying to do to make your business more sustainable? Eric, you there? We can't seem to hear you. Maybe if I could Sorry. go to you, I'll, I'll All right. go ahead. Maintaining a um, good relationship with our key stakeholder partners is very important to us. And um, going forward, because most of our activities, apart from fertilizer sales, we do a lot of um, collaborative activities, activities with these stakeholder, uh, stakeholders. So maintaining a good relationship with them is one key thing we think will help us to sustain our business model here in Ghana. Because most of our activities are, have to do with business development activities. And then um, we do a lot of um, collaborative activities with these agencies and then enriching the farmer, we think we need to work with. So maintaining good and healthy relationship with them is one key point that will help us to uh, sustain our business here in Ghana. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, just very quickly, I'm Alex Broby, your own view on sustainability and, and uh, you know, how you make your business sustainable these days. Uh, sustainability is the order of the honest. As traders, um, we drive our sustainability program because it gives us a very good story so and also to make us competitive enough okay whenever we are dealing with our customers in this is the chocolate years now um sustainability program that we are uh, um, rolling with farmers they basically is targeting improving their livelihoods um improving the environment and also improving the productivity if we are able to achieve these goals then we can count on having a very credible sustainability program. So it's, a, it's the order of the day and it's really helping us in this business because we are traders, we only buy, but we need to have a very good marketing story that, hey, this is where we are sourcing. This is how best we are helping farmers in that area to make them produce all year round and also to protect the environment and improve uh, our productivity and their livelihood. So it's very important for our business. Thank you. It's interesting to see actually with sustainability how it's gone from the pages on CSR at the back of the report to the first page which is on ESG. So that really shows it's becoming part of business. Well, Lally, we've got one minute. Do you want to give the final word on sustainability from your view? Yeah. Um, so at Farmerline, for us, a prosperous farmer is the most sustainable strategy we can work towards uh, in the agricultural sector. And for us, our focus on solutions we build uh, is basically to help the farmer cut down cost, save, and then end more. And uh, we just don't use technology. We also believe there's a human connection to that, uh, to help sell farmers, especially in the part of the world where we work in. And a good mix of that will ensure efficient delivery of services, um, provide a win-win situation, and ultimately uh, put in the customer in our case, uh, pharma or our business partners are the center of the solutions that we deliver. So yeah, that for us defines our sustainability as a business. Excellent, thank you very much. And I think definitely sustainability is now part and parcel of ordinary business. And I think when it can become aligned actually with good business practice rather than a nice add-on, then ultimately everyone will win and we will have not only a sustainable agricultural sector, but companies that actually survive beyond a few seasons. So I'm afraid we're out of time. I'd like to thank my wonderful panelists, uh, Melanie, Alexander, uh, Alex, uh, Wallali and Eric. We've had quite an international panel. We've had people calling in from uh, West Africa, from Dubai, uh, from Australia. Melanie, thank you very much for staying up so late for this. And of course, I'm in London as well. So thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.